Thank you, everybody. Thank you for that honor. That was really sweet. Uh, well, my wife Kate and I celebrated our 33rd anniversary yesterday. So uh, stand up, honey. I want everybody to see you. I just want you to honor my, my wife. She's amazing. And um, yeah, it was, it was special. And I actually, for, for us, it was so special to celebrate our 33rd anniversary and be part of leading the encounter retreat. Because the level of the beauty of Jesus and the Father's love and the sweet presence of the Holy Spirit and everybody's hunger was just such a gift of love to Kate and I to be part of that event. And uh, we just went home and thought, that's probably the best anniversary. Um, you know, you can go all kinds of places, you can do all kinds of self-indulgent things, but there's such a joy in just seeing God's people being just so wrecked in the love of God it was, and power of God. It was amazing. Ah, woo. Wow, thank you, Holy Spirit. Well, it's my joy to continue the, um, the series that we're in, in the book of Ephesians. And uh, we're now up to Ephesians chapter 4. So I'd like to invite all of you um, to turn with me in your Bibles or your, your Bible on your app or whatever uh, to Ephesians chapter 4. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the plan and the purpose that you have for us as a church family and for the church families all over the world, the body of Christ. Thank you for your plan that in Christ Jesus, we would grow up in the power of the Holy Spirit into the full measure of the stature of Christ. And Lord, we just can't even begin to imagine what that will be. But we ask you that here in Catch the Fire, Raleigh, Durham, that each of us, Lord, you would grip us and that you would help us all to become all that you desire in the full measure of the stature of Christ for us to become that. Lord, we know that in eternity, we're going to be in our new bodies looking just and being just like you in your glorified, majestic, majesty that you're in, in your resurrection, eternal life. And we're going to live forever with you in the new heaven that's the new earth. But we ask you that before we die, whatever highest potential we can have together to become the fullness of the stature of the body of Christ here on earth, that you would give us that grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Verse 1, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, Paul is writing this from prison, beseech you, Ephesians, to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body. And one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all y'all. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now this he ascended, what does it mean? But also that he first descended into the lower parts of the earth. He who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. Woo! And he himself 
gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying or the building up of the body of Christ till we all come to the unity of faith, of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, a perfect human being, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men or women in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of catch the fire Raleigh Durham, the body, for the edifying or the building of itself in love. This I say therefore and testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over to lewdness to work all uncleanness with greediness. But you have not learned, you have not so learned Christ, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. That you put off, that you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man, which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, that you put on the new man, that you put on the new man, woo, which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, putting away lying, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor. For we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not, let your, do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place or opportunity to the devil. Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with their hands what is good, that he or she may have something to give those who has need. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth. Don't drop the F-bomb. But what is good for necessary edification, building up, that it may impart grace to the hearers. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, or loud quarreling is what it means as well. And evil speaking be put away from you with all malice or wicked meanness. And be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Wow, what a passage of scripture! What an extraordinary message! in the letter of Paul to the church of, of Ephesus, a church that he started. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just so excited, all of you, to be able to preach this morning on this amazing passage of Scripture because it shows us our full potential together. And just studying this this week, my heart caught fire. I just, I'm just so excited about who we all can become together. I want you to know that there's not one of us who on our own 
can experience what Paul's talking about here. It takes all of us together to become all that he's talking about. That means that in this journey, we absolutely rely on love in one another. And we walk circumspectly because what we do has an enormous effect upon the church family that we have the privilege and responsibility to be part of. Well, this is such an enormous, enormous subject with so much richness. We could preach on this, spend a whole year in this chapter as a church and still be wanting in discovering more. And so I thought, you know what? I'm going to give my best shot at being able to just give some broad brush strokes as well as enough detail so that we together as a church family can really, really go on an adventure, a journey of discovering what could be the full potential of this church to become the full measure of the stature of Christ. Something that we can, it's just beyond our knowing, but to grow up into him unto the full stature of Christ. So my message, if you could put up the first slide, please. I decided to make a PowerPoint, a keynote, a, a keynote uh, presentation for you so that you can learn in a more succinct way from a very large, enormous chapter with so much in it and just bring it down and distill it into the salient things that the Lord gave me this week. So the chapter is called Unto the Full Stature of Christ. And I want to just give credit to Kate and I's amazing PA, Monique Cook, who took, yeah, she's, a, she's extraordinary, who took, uh, I did all the words, um, and then I gave her my PowerPoint presentation, and she ripped it up and started again. She just ripped it up and started all over again. Um, not with my words, but she made a way better job of the slides and I just want to give her credit. So the, the, the title of my message this morning is Unto the Full Stature of Christ. And the subtext is Paul's commandments. That's right, I wrote that deliberately and carefully. Paul's commandments so that we walk worthy of the calling with which we are called collectively together. And I initially wrote in brackets, but this morning as I was putting the final touches, I just decided to take it back. But I put Paul's brackets, 10 commandments, because you're going to see at the end I've done a chart. And it, it, it's absolutely amazing when you take those, um, the last half of this passage, Paul literally has 10 commandments. 10 commandments. It's almost as though, you know, in the rhythm of Scripture, uh, the Lord is giving us, this is the blueprint of how you walk in the Spirit. The 10 commandments was the blueprint of how you live under the law. And then Paul comes and he says, now that we're in the Spirit, the law is not done away with. The law is fulfilled. And by the way, now you get to live in the Holy Spirit with these commandments. All right. So, as I was reading this passage, I realized that over the last 30 years in which I've been in the paradigm of fivefold ministry, I realized that the fivefold has really overshadowed for a lot of us, myself included, the second half of what Paul the Apostle is actually wanting to bring, which is actually what the fivefold's all about. But there's nothing like a title that gets each one of us goosebumpy about some significance that we can gain from that title. And you know, if God doesn't give us a title and man doesn't give us a title, we'll give ourselves a title. <laughs> and there's nothing like apostle, prophet, evangelist, teacher, pastor. 
to make us get really excited about some significance we can get from the five-fold ministry. <laughs> so, next slide. So, I thought that we could have a look at over the 30 years that I've walked in this paradigm of fivefold Jesus gifts to his body, I just thought I'd just put in some, um, some understanding for all of us of what the fivefold gifts actually are. So, number one, the apostle. The apostle, the Bible tells us in another passage, Paul says, first the apostle. What he's meaning is not first the apostle and everybody else is underneath. He's saying first the apostle. In other words, the person who arrives first is the apostle. Because the word apostle actually means sent one. And so if you're an apostle, you're an apostle because someone sent you, namely Christ and his church, his body. In, uh, in Antioch, Paul was a prophet and a teacher. His name was Saul at that time, and he and Barnabas were prophets and teachers. But the Holy Spirit, while they were ministering to the Lord with fasting, worshiping the Lord with fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work that I've called them to. And so as they prayed with fasting, they laid hands on them and sent them out. And as they went in the power of the Spirit, it was in the going in the power of the Spirit that Saul became Apostle Paul. And it was not a title he gave himself. It was a title that he says when he describes those who call themselves apostles, who are actually false apostles, he defines a false apostle as someone who calls themselves an apostle, who appoints themselves an apostle. So I've got news for you, everybody. Not one of us in this room want to be a false apostle. So whatever you do, don't appoint yourself as an apostle. However, I've also got good news for you. Heaven has appointed some to be apostles. And through his church and through the Holy Spirit, other people will call you an apostle, if indeed you are an apostle. And if you are, we'll be saying bye-bye to you because you'll be going somewhere. All right, so the apostle is a planter, builder. Their role, I'm going to use sheep as an illustration. I have spent a lot of time um, as a hired hand among shepherds, physical, real shepherds, both in Australia and in England. And I, I know quite a lot about sheep. An apostle finds new pasture and establishes new flocks through signs and wonders. For us here in this local church, apostolic ministry is starting a connect group. The moment you start a connect group, you've started walking towards becoming an apostle. So congratulations, all of you who've started a connect group. Well done. You are in apostolic ministry. You've started new pasture. You've created a new pasture where other sheep can come and actually feed through your life. Woo! The prophet. The prophet is a revelatory inspirer. Helps sheep see the shepherd and learn to hear God's voice and know his voice and thereby know the way to walk. A prophet's role is not to call out the sin of the church. A prophet is not to be spectacular. A prophet is not to be a celebrity. A prophet is never, ever, to use the gift of prophecy in order to set themselves up above the one they're prophesying over. A prophet, the role of the prophet, the role of all of the fivefold is to raise up other prophets, to help everybody become amazing apostles, amazing 
prophets, amazing teachers, amazing pastors, amazing evangelists. The evangelist. The evangelist is the preacher, the caller, finds the lost sheep and brings them into the fold. Some of you are amazing already at being able to share the simple gospel and bring and invite people to church. But Paul's saying, I want all y'all to be good at that. And the way I want all y'all to be good at that is that I'm going I'm to say to you all, Jesus has made some to be particularly gifted, not so that they can go and do it, but so that you can come alongside them, they can come alongside you and help you learn to be really good at it because it's your work to bring the lost home. Each one of us, the pastor, the shepherd gatherer, sees and cares for the sheep's needs. I mean, you get around somebody who's a true pastor and oh my goodness, their tender heart towards people is beautiful. It's absolutely beautiful. One of my favorites is my own son-in-law, an amazing man of God who just has this extraordinary ability, Aaron, to be able to look into your heart and know you might have a smile on your face, but just like Bree was saying, and by the way, Bree, that was one of the most spectacular testimonies. I was absolutely blown away by how vulnerable, how transparent, how humble, and how wonderfully godly you are. You did a brilliant job. Oh my goodness. You made me feel in love with Jesus. Ah, shakaraba. Mm. And if you wonder why I do those kinds of things, you have to remember I'm a Nigerian. It's just my skin is, gives it away that makes it more challenging. For those of you who know any Nigerians, you know we're, we're passionate people. Okay, number five, the teacher. The teacher. The teacher is a passionate Bible teacher. I want you to notice I wrote passionate. Passionate Bible trainer. They feed and instruct the sheep on supernatural life. You know what? If you're a boring Bible teacher, please stop it. <laughs> Good gracious. Okay. And if you're being taught the Bible by someone boring, go find a passionate Bible trainer who's a five-fold teacher. Why? Because the whole point of that five-fold teacher is to turn you into a passionate trainer of others. And if they're a boring Bible teacher, you're going to be very dull and boring. And we don't want Catch the Fire to be that kind of church. You see, this church, the beauty of this church is we get to be together the church. And if we don't want boring, we can just let the Holy Spirit get rid of boring. It's great. I love it. Come on, Holy Spirit. Get rid of boring. Whatever boring is left in me, get rid of it. All right. Okay. All right. Let's go to the next one, please. Oh, oh, oh. The feed and instruct the sheep on supernatural life. Good Bible teaching and training is not taking out all the supernatural out of the Bible. In fact, the Bible is so full of the supernatural, there probably would only be the, the contents page and the numbers at the bottom if you took all the supernatural out of it. So don't tell me you're a Bible teacher if you don't believe in the supernatural work of God. Shakaraba. You know, if you're, if you're that intelligent that you can take all the supernatural out of the Bible, you probably should be a physicist or something. Anyway, okay. I'm just having fun, everybody. All right. What is that next slide, please? What is the purpose of the fivefold? Well, the purpose, number one, to equip the saints. Not to have a title. Not to have a business card that says apostle so-and-so or pastor so-and-so. Not to have a car parking space that says, you know, rabbi or teacher so-and-so. Not to have a new title in front of your name, evangelist so-and-so. No, it's for, it's for the equipping of the saints. Equipping of the saints. What for? Number two, for the saints, 
work of ministry. Notice that apostrophe right there. The ministry that the saints do. The whole purpose of being an apostle, pastor, let me just say fivefold from now on so I don't have to go through. The whole purpose of the fivefold is so that the ministry that belongs to the saints is done spectacularly well. Are you with me? You know, I remember when somebody said, just the, I was having lunch with them and they, I just noticed that they kept using, and by the way, I'm, I'm going to use the vocation of someone totally different so you can't guess who they were. But I was sitting with them and I noticed that they just kept referring to me, Pastor this, pa Pastor Duncan this, Pastor Duncan this, Pastor Duncan that. And I was like, you know what? My mom, I said, you know, thank you so much for wanting to honor me. That's really sweet of you. But I just want you to know, okay, when my mum and dad, who are here, by the way, where are you, mum and dad? Give me a wave. When my mum and dad, when my mum and dad, when my mum gave birth to me after hours and hours and hours, 30-something hours of labor, thank you, mum, and I was finally born, and she looked at me and she loved me, and which she told me on Friday night, at the encounter retreat. She came to the encounter retreat, my mother. Come on. And I say that because she's been to, I don't know how many encounter retreats and, and leaders schools and all the things, but she's just so hungry for God. And I just love that. And when I grow up, mom, I want to be just like you. And when my mom looked at me and my dad and my dad looked at me, they both looked at each other and I will give him a simple name, Duncan. And he can go even simpler, dunk. You know, like Dunkin' Donut. <laughs> Which, by the way, my name's Duncan. Not Duncan. Not Duncan. Just Duncan. Just Duncan. Just let it flow. Just Duncan. <laughs> okay. <laughs> anyway, they did not call me Pastor Duncan. And so I said to this friend of mine, I said, look, Please stop saying that. Just call me Duncan. Because I don't call you lawyer so-and-so. Right? You know, midwife so-and-so. Just, just keep it simple, everybody around here, okay? Yeah, unless you're a doctor, then we're happy to honor you. Because you look after all everybody's bodies, you know? We'll call you doctor. That's all right. Okay, number three. So... For the saints' work of ministry, and by the way, that ministry of the church is by the saints. So please don't come to church and be a spectator of everybody who has a microphone around here, okay? You're already joining in beautifully by the worship. That's the primary reason we come together, is that we worship together, that we are collective and we worship Jesus together. And, uh, you know, the, anyway, and it, it's just... And the teaching is to equip you so that you can be in full-time ministry. You are in full-time ministry. Say that with me. I am in full-time ministry. It doesn't matter if you're in business or if you're in education or you're in health or healthcare or whatever it is, or you're, you're looking after, you know, displaced peoples. Whoever you are, you are an apostle. You are a pastor. You are a teacher. You are an evangelist. You are a prophet because Jesus in you is all five of those things. And he's appointed some to regularly help remind you that you are all of those things and that you have an amazing full-time ministry that's your ministry with Jesus and if you add the sum total of all of that collective up together all our ministries together just think about how epic that is I think about Hal right here he's an extraordinary evangelist he's an extraordinary preacher missionary he's got an amazing ministry in Myanmar he's and here he is he's part of our church but he's a five-fold apostle. And, and he's a five-fold evangelist. And pretty prophetic too. Five-fold prophet. And I'm not buttering him up. I'm telling you because God put him alongside all of us so that we can all learn from him, so that we can all be epic 
epic in our way, in our field, doing what we've learned from people like him to do it better, all unto the glory of Jesus. And as we do that, we will grow up to the full measure of the stature of Christ. And when you, when you hear or see of someone doing extraordinary, spectacular things in this church, you know, and you see them and the gift that they have and the character that they have and the anointing that they carry, get excited because their presence alongside you makes you epic. Don't be jealous of them. They're God's love gift to you and you are love, God's love gift to them. And collectively, we all make each other amazing. I think of Devon. Devon. Devon is one of the most gifted people that I know, except for his wife, Danielle. She's more gifted than he is. <laughs> and their son, Quest, is probably the most gifted of the three of them. And why not? Because that's how it should be in families. It's like our grandchildren, all four of our grandkids, they're way ahead of Kate and I, way ahead of where we were when we were little. No offense, mom and dad, but they just, you know what I'm saying? Every generation grows on each other's shoulders, stands on the shoulders of the giants that went before them. Okay, number three, for the healthy building up of the body, the ministries for the whole. Number four, the whole body surrendered to the lordship of Jesus, our head. Guys, we need to settle the issue of lordship. What do I mean by that? Well, I heard somebody in England preaching just recently and uh, just a young guy in, our, in one of our Catch the Fire churches, very anointed, excellent, I think 25 years old, preached a phenomenal message. And in his phenomenal message, he said something along these lines. For each of you, like me, who struggle with sin, um, or maybe some specific ongoing areas and patterns of sin. So for example, maybe you struggle with exaggeration. Maybe you struggle with getting angry and losing your temper. Maybe you struggle with pornography. Maybe you struggle with kindness. Maybe you struggle with forgiveness. Whatever your struggle with sin is, maybe you struggle spending money that you know you shouldn't be spending. Whatever your struggle is, the issue is not that you love the sin. The issue is you're not surrendered to the Lordship of Jesus you have an issue with lordship. Man, that just exploded in me when I heard that. That's so helpful. Okay, next slide. And what is the goal of the fivefold? The unity of the faith in the unity of the spirit. In Greek, that's entones, enotes, sorry, communal rules that encourage righteous behavior from holiness. That's what that means from the Dead Sea Scrolls and the amazing community that preserved the Dead Sea Scrolls. They're the only ones outside of, and by the way, this unity of the faith, unity of the spirit, that word unity, enotes, only appears in the Bible twice in those verses. And, but they use this word to denote the communal rules that encourage righteous behavior coming from holiness. If you'd been on the encounter retreat, you would have found out why you are holy and how you became holy and that you are one with Christ and he's your holiness. And because we are his holy people, then now from that holiness flows this desire that his righteousness, which is also a gift, is the way we walk. And when we start to walk in the revelation of our union with Christ, holiness, and out of that revelation, we start to act and behave in righteousness, his righteousness flowing through us, this church family is going to go epic, epic, epic. And so, number two, we grow to the knowledge of the Son of God. He knows each of us intimately, and we know him intimately. Guys, that moment where Jesus said, I'll say to those people, I never knew you. That is just so grieving in my heart. 
I'm like, Lord, please don't ever say that to me, that I never knew you. Lord, know every secret part of me, every sneaky part of me. Just know it all, Lord. And you know, I was talking with somebody at the end of the first service, and they asked me about reading the Bible. And I said, do it every day, cover to cover through every year. And when you read it, don't just read the Word of God. Let the Word of God read you. Okay. Thirdly, until we are full-grown human, collective human, perfect, complete, lacking nothing, and mature, a gorgeous bride fit for her bridegroom. Fourthly, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. In other words, our collective completion is something that we can never achieve alone. The fullness of his stature is our collective community corporate goal, everybody. Okay? So when you are in that secret place tempted to sin, remember that your sin is not only bringing Jesus back into it, you're bringing all of us with you into it. And when you say no to it, you're actually for all of us saying no, and we're all going that one step further into the fullness of the maturity of the stature of Christ. Hallelujah! What a potential. Okay, next. Mature, no longer children. Two, stable, no longer tossed to and fro. Three, wise and discerning of the truth, not tossed by every wind of doctrine, trickery of men, or the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. Which, by the way, is even more dangerous now with the internet access. You know what this looks like? It looks like this, that when you're immature, you've got this, you've got this, let's say you're like, okay, I love the gifts of the Holy Spirit. I just love tongues, I love prophecy, I love knowledge. And then you bump into somebody and they turn around and they go, you know, in my church, they've already taught us all that has gone. You're a fake. You're a charlatan. Well, when you're not tossed to and fro, you don't cave in. Oh my gosh, I just can't believe it. And it takes you six months to recover. Okay? You know that you know that you know. Hang on a moment, and you have an answer for them. You say, hey, what, what makes you say that? What do they teach you? Oh, they teach us, you know, 1, uh, 1 Corinthians 13, that where there's tongues, they cease. Where there's prophecy, it ceases. Where there's knowledge, it ceases. Whoa, 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 what, what did you just say? Okay, so you're saying that tongues and prophecy have ceased? Yes. Okay, with the apostles, right? The first ones. Yes. Okay, okay, and that we're not to do it, right? Okay, uh, but what about knowledge? Proper exegesis would say knowledge has also passed away, therefore. So how come you guys keep having so many Bible studies? I'll quit speaking in tongues and prophecy when you quit doing Bible studies. Then I'll know the perfect's come. All right, let's get, move to the last one. I've made this for you. I want you to get your cell phones out and take a picture of this because this is the blueprint of Catch the Fire family walking together in the corporate desire to be the new man together and to come into the full measure of the stature of Christ, the full stature of Christ. Okay, so number one, the old man, I've taken, by the way, I've taken all of this from everything that Paul says from verse 17 to 32. Okay? It's all there. 